Hi guys. One of the most important ideas in all of mathematics is the proof. We have many guesses and well-supported ideas, but mathematicians are simply not content to accept them as true without a rigorous mathematical proof. However, it turns out that proofs are actually not as powerful as one might think. In fact, there actually exist true statements that can never be proven, as we will show in this video. In particular, I am going to be talking about three increasingly complex and counterintuitive results culminating in Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which will give us a surprisingly strong limit on what an axiomatic system can and cannot prove. Furthermore, such results bring up deep philosophical questions about the nature of mathematics. Also, before we start, I just want to say thank you so, so much for 500 subscribers. It is unbelievably cool, and I'm really, really glad you guys are watching and enjoying my videos. And if you ever have suggestions or ideas for a new video, uh, just feel free to put them in the comments. So let's get started. First of all, we need to understand what a proof really is, and to do this, we need to talk about axiomatic systems. Now, an axiom is defined by Wikipedia as a, quote, statement that is taken to be true to serve as a premise or starting point for further reasoning or argument. Basically, the idea is that we need to start off with some building blocks and just assume that they are valid. And then from there, we combine our axioms together and along with some basic logic, use them in a long chain to create a proof. Now, the standard choice of axioms in mathematics is usually something called ZFC, which stands for zermelo frankel plus the axiom of choice. Now, for most of this video, we will be using ZFC as our choice of axioms when talking about proofs. However, keep in mind that the results basically hold for any set of axioms. We aren't using anything super special about ZFC specifically here. So our first result is going to be the famous halting problem. Now, this result gives us a limitation on what computers can calculate and on which problems they can actually solve. So choose some arbitrary programming language. The actual choice doesn't really matter that much. In mathematics, we would normally just use something called a Turing machine, but you can really just imagine using programs in Python or C++ or any other programming language you are familiar with. Now, given some arbitrary program in this language, it can either run forever and never stop, or it can eventually stop running. So the halting problem simply asks for a given program if it is going to ever halt or not. Now, some programs are going to clearly halt after a few steps, while others might easily be seen to loop and run forever. Yet, sometimes it might be hard to tell for some programs if they are going to stop or not. For all we know, they could go on for a super duper long time and then stop after like a Google Plug steps or something even bigger. So it would be kind of cool if we could just figure out some way to write a program, let's call it P, that could theoretically solve the halting problem. Now what we mean by that is we can input any program in our programming language into P and P is going to spit out in finite time whether or not that program will ever halt. But then the question arises, does such a program P even exist? Is there even a computer program that can determine if another given program is going to halt? And the answer is no, there actually is not a program that can do this. This is a limitation on what computers can do. And there are many proofs of this fact, but the one that we are going to be using involves a very cool argument about computable numbers. The proof goes as follows. Assume for contradiction that there was some magical program P that could take some arbitrary program as input and then determine if it will ever halt or not. Now, let's choose some number n that is much larger than the length of the program P. For example, we could choose n to be twice the length of P or 10 times or whatever, as long as it's sufficiently larger than P. The exact specifics don't really matter that much. Now, every program of size less than n is either going to go on forever or it is going to halt. And so therefore, there must be some program that is the last one to ever halt of all the programs with size less than n. And after that halts, no more are ever going to halt. And so let the number of steps this program takes before it halts be equal to m. That is, if we run one of our programs for m steps, it must have either halted or it must go on forever because of how we defined m. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define the program q to cause a contradiction. Q is going to systematically take every single program with less than n characters and it's going to run P on that program to tell if it ever stops. Then, once Q knows which programs are ever going to halt, it's just going to run each one of these programs and determine which one takes the longest to do so. In other words, Q is going to be able to figure out what the value of M is because it's just going to run through every program that halts, figure out what the last one is, and then it'll know the value of M. Then, all we have to do is just program Q to like wait m plus one steps and then halt. And suddenly we realize that Q itself 
which is written in less than in characters, is taking longer than m steps to halt. But because of how we defined m, every program of less than n characters must stop after m steps. So therefore we have reached a contradiction because q simultaneously is taking at least m plus 1 steps to stop, but it also must only go on for at most m steps because it has length less than n. And so therefore, our assumption that there was a program p that could solve the halting problem must have actually been wrong. This result is already very counterintuitive and quite interesting. We have shown that no computer can solve the halting problem, and hence that there actually exist problems that no computer can solve, which by itself is not immediately obvious. Now, this fundamental limit on the power of computers can in fact be extended to a limit on the power of proofs. Indeed, there actually exist true statements that cannot be proven, as we will now show. Now, our goal is going to be to take our result from the halting problem and apply it to proofs in general. So let's assume for contradiction that every single true statement was provable. So given a true statement, there exists some finite and checkable demonstration that is true. Then define the following program P. P is going to take in some arbitrary program Q as its input and is going to simultaneously do two things. First of all, P is going to be running the program Q and is going to be checking if it ever halts. So eventually, if Q halts, P will figure that out. However, at the same time, P is also going to be systematically checking every single possible proof looking for a proof that Q runs forever. If Q indeed runs forever, then by our assumption that every true statement has a proof, there actually exists some proof that it runs forever. And then since P is going to methodically check every single possible proof, eventually P is going to find this proof that Q goes on forever, and then it will be able to determine this. This basically means that if Q does not go on forever, P will eventually find out. And it means if P does go on forever, P will find this proof and find out. So therefore, P can determine whether or not an arbitrary program is ever going to halt. But that means P solves a halting problem, which we already know is impossible. So therefore, our original assumption must have been false. And so there actually do exist true statements that cannot be proven. Okay, so let's take stock of what we've done so far. We have shown that there exist true statements that do not have a proof within ZFC, which is already by itself pretty interesting. Now we can take this one step farther. We are going to show that there exist statements that cannot be proven within ZFC, yet there exist proofs as long as you assume that ZFC itself is consistent, meaning that it doesn't prove anything false. Basically what, th what this means is that we can show that there are things that cannot be proven by ZFC, yet can be proven if we allow ourselves to just use as a fact that ZFC is non-self-contradictory. And then after we show this, we will use it to prove that ZFC cannot demonstrate its own consistency, which is a really cool result that is basically Gödel's incompleteness theorem, or at least part of it. But let's get started with the proof of this fact. So let's define a Turing machine S. And what S is going to do is it's going to look for a proof that it is never going to halt. And then once it finds such a proof, it is going to halt. That is what we are going to program S to do. And it's going to look through all conceivable proofs using ZFC of that statement. Now, the question is, will S halt or not? And first of all, we know that there cannot exist a proof in ZFC that S never halts. Because if there existed such a proof, since S is going through all possible proofs of that fact, it would eventually find that proof and therefore it would halt, which would be a contradiction because we would have just found a proof of something false. So therefore there does not exist a proof in ZFC that S is going to go on forever. So that's one part of it. The other part is if we assume that ZFC is consistent, we can in fact find a proof that S never halts. So how do we do this? Well, very similarly, we assume for contradiction that S was to halt. Now for it to halt, it would have had to find a proof that it never halted. But since we're assuming ZFC is valid, that would mean that it never halted. Because if we find a valid proof in ZFC, and since we're allowed to assume here that ZFC is consistent, this implies that it must be true that it never halts. But this immediately causes a contradiction because we started by assuming S halts. So since we've reached contradiction, we have generated a proof where the only assumption we used was that ZFC is consistent, and from there we determined that S is never going to halt. 
So just to quickly summarize, what we have done is we have shown that, first of all, there exists no proof in ZFC that S is never going to halt. And second of all, we have shown that there exists a proof where we use ZFC being consistent inside the proof that does show that S is never going to halt. So this is a pretty cool accomplishment that we've shown these two things that it can be proved with one set of axioms, but it cannot be proved with another. But it turns out we can actually use this and take it a step farther to get something even weirder. ZFC cannot be used to prove it itself is consistent. To see this, note that we have already shown that there is a proof that S never halts in ZFC plus the axiom that ZFC is consistent. Now, if we were to assume for contradiction that ZFC could prove that it was itself consistent, then adding on the result that ZFC is consistent as an axiom would be superfluous. In other words, anything proven using this additional axiom that ZFC is consistent could also be proven without it, just using ZFC without any additional axioms. Therefore, a proof using ZFC plus axiom that ZFC is consistent that S never halts can just be turned into a very similar proof that S never halts using only ZFC because the additional axiom that we're using in the proof would actually contribute nothing in our axiomatic system since it could have just been initially derived from the axiomatic system. However, this contradicts our earlier result that ZFC cannot in fact prove that S is going to go on forever. So therefore, our assumption that ZFC would be able to prove that it itself was consistent must have been false. And so therefore, ZFC cannot prove its own consistency. To put it in other words, what we have done is taken the observation that adding this additional axiom that ZFC is consistent is going to allow us to prove more results, strictly more results than we initially could, and then we use that observation to show that that additional axiom cannot therefore be derived solely from ZFC in the first place. It is strictly outside of ZFC. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned more about the ways in which using hypothetical programs can push mathematics to yield new and counterintuitive insights and to reveal the limitations of proofs and of axiomatic systems. Thanks again for 500 subscribers and thank you so much for watching. Bye.